believe many more projects could come forward. Thank you. That concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Jackson Carlo. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, in the independence referendum campaign just a few short years ago, the First Minister pledged we should keep the UK pound permanently, forever, because in her words, that was in the best interests of Scotland. Yet this week, she and the SNP voted to ditch the UK pound. So tell me, First Minister, how on earth is dumping the pound in the best interests of Scotland? First Minister. Well, of course, an independent Scotland, which I look forward to happening very soon, uh, would, <laughs> use, would use the pound while that was in our interests until such times as the conditions were right to move to a different arrangement. Because, you see, that is the benefit of independence. We take decisions that are right for our interests here in Scotland rather than having decisions that are against our interests imposed on us by Westminster. But I have to say, and I in some ways admire him for this actually, because it is very, very brave of Jackson Carlaw to stand up here today and talk about currency. Uh, when he next gets to his feet, and purely in the interest of transparency, would he care to share with the Chamber uh, how much of its value the pound has lost in the last couple of years directly as a result of Tory policy on Brexit? <laughs> Jackson Carlo. <laughs> True to the last the First Minister's practising for two years from now when she's sitting here as Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. <laughs> because because what, her, what her answer boils down to is this. Five years ago it was keep the pound forever, it's it's today it's ditch the pound as soon as possible. Yeah. And I hope the First Minister's got those six tests written down in front of her today because she had a wee bit of a problem yesterday remembering what they actually were. Uh, one of them, uh, which she did forget about then, is would a separate currency meet the needs of Scottish residents and businesses for stability and continuity of their financial arrangements and would it command wide support? So having failed yesterday, let me offer the First Minister a chance to redeem herself today. Will she name a single business representative body or trade union which has given its support to scrapping the pound. First Minister. Well, I'm sure businesses and trade unions across the country will want to see a Scottish Parliament with the ability to do what is right for Scotland. But if he wants to hear some views, uh, let's hear some views uh, of businesses and others about the immediate threat that is facing Scotland. How about the Institute of Directors? It's difficult to imagine a policy that inflicts more economic harm on Scotland than Brexit. How about the Resolution Foundation? Household incomes are around £1,500 a year lower today as a result of Brexit. The Federation of Small Businesses, the recent months of turmoil, political uncertainty, economic uncertainty have had a negative impact on business confidence. Uh, the former chair of Standard Life, Brexit is an unmitigated disaster. The principal of Glasgow University, Brexit is the single biggest public crisis we've had to face in living memory. It's because of that disaster being imposed on Scotland that Scotland needs the power to take our own decisions. And the Tories are laughing about it, but it is no laughing matter for businesses and individuals the length and breadth of the country. And lastly, presiding officer, uh, Jackson Carlaw talks about who's going to be in opposition and in government in a couple of years' time. I should today congratulate him on his period of acting leadership of the Conservative Party, because polls at the weekend suggested that under his stewardship, the Tories have gone from second place in Scottish politics to third place, or actually in one poll, to fourth place in Scottish politics. Those of us in these benches thoroughly endorse Jackson Carlaw's record in office. Jackson Carlaw. That is, that, is that is customarily generous of the First Minister. Um, I can assure her that unlike some, I won't be coming to her for a reference, uh, but, I do, but, I, but I do have a sister-in-law who does HR and can help polish up that CV she's apparently got sitting with the UN where she's looking for a future job opportunity. But, but let me wish her well in the two years, or perhaps significantly less time, left to her before the next election, two years today.
Now, perhaps there is actually a reason why, in that great big long list of quotations, uh, Nicola Sturgeon didn't actually list one from anybody who is in favour of scrapping the pound. Perhaps it's because Nicola Sturgeon's plan from day one of independence could lead to an estimated 45,000 Scottish homes being pushed into negative equity, similar to that seen during the 2008 financial crisis. Now, I know the SNP don't like to hear it, but unfortunately for them, that's not just our view. It's the verdict this week of Richard Marsh, one of the First Minister's own economic experts. Has he, an advisor to her own Growth Commission, just got it all wrong? First Minister. Well, of course, the essence of independence is that we take the decisions in this Parliament that are right for Scotland, so that we don't have to have imposed upon us by Westminster decisions that are damaging to our interests. The real threat to Scotland right now is that damage to our economy coming from Brexit, described as a disaster uh, by so many businesses, individuals and academics, the length and breadth of the country. That's why we see support for independence increasing. It's why we see support for this government increasing. And it's why we see support for the Scottish Conservatives starting to go through the floor. Because people in Scotland know that the time is coming when we need to get rid of Tory governments once and for all and take control of our own future into our own hands. Jackson Carlo. Um. So, so we've got a plan by the First Minister to ditch the pound and create a new Scottish currency. Yesterday she couldn't remember the six tests that she herself had set for it. It's not supported by any impartial business groups or trade unions. Her own party's Growth Commission advisor think it's a turkey. The First Minister was right when she said that permanently keeping the UK pound is in the best interests of Scotland. Yeah. Isn't it just a simple fact? that the, way, the best way to keep Scotland successful, to protect our pensions, to boost jobs, is for Scotland to have nothing whatsoever, nothing whatsoever to do with Nicola Sturgeon's plans for a breakaway currency, to keep our UK pound and keep Scotland in the UK. First Minister. Presiding officer, as uh, people with slightly longer memories than it suits Jackson Carlaw to have uh, will recall, is that Jackson Carlaw and his colleagues told Scotland in 2014 that we wouldn't be allowed to keep the UK pound. There is not a shred of consistency in their arguments. What independence means is that we take decisions that are right for the interests of businesses and individuals, the length and breadth of our country. And what it means is that we don't have to face the prospect of decisions like Brexit being imposed on us by Westminster. That's why we see support for independence rising and it's why we see the terror in the eyes of Jackson Carlow and his colleagues uh, as they see the writing well and truly on the wall. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, Presiding officer, the Scottish Labour Party welcomes today's commitment from the Scottish Government to meet ambitious climate change targets. This is the future of our planet and we need emergency action now. But we also need to ensure that the transition to a net zero greenhouse gas economy is a just transition, one that is socially just and one that benefits working people in Scotland. The First Minister's predecessor promised us that renewable energy and the low carbon economy would deliver 130,000 jobs for Scotland by 2020. Can the First Minister tell us Will this promise be delivered? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I uh, welcome uh, Richard Leonard's uh, focus on climate change today? I hope everybody across the chamber welcomes the fact that Scotland, uh, in the commitments here that we are making today, are not just continuing our role as a world leader, but we're actually redefining the bar of world leadership, and everybody in Scotland should be proud of that. Uh, Richard Leonard is right to talk about just transition. That is why uh, the Environment Secretary has already established a just transition commission, something we were encouraged to do by the STUC, and that the work of that commission will be extremely important. Meeting those targets, of course, uh, mean that we have to up our ambition and our action across the whole range of government responsibilities, uh, and that puts a responsibility on the shoulders of opposition parties as well, uh, not to have knee-jerk opposition uh, to everything that is tough or challenging, as we've seen Labour and other opposition parties do in quite recent times. On the issue of jobs, there are today around uh, 50,000 jobs across our economy as a result of the move to renewable energy and low carbon 
energy. The turnover from that sector is around £11 billion pounds a year. Uh, but I've been very frank that Scotland is not yet doing as well on that front as we should be doing, which is why this morning at our initiative, uh, a summit has been taking place, including the unions, to look at how we increase the supply chain benefits of these big renewable uh, energy projects. And I hope we have the support of all parties across this chamber as we make sure that as we do the morally right thing on climate change, we also deliver all of the economic benefits in Scotland that people want to see. Richard Leonard. <clears throat> Uh, presiding officer, according to the Scottish TUC, only 46,000 uh, jobs have been created in the sector where the government promised 130,000 jobs. That's just over a third of the number promised. And we all know that the figure would be much higher if contract after contract for wind turbines had not been awarded to supply chains overseas. Moving to a low carbon economy, a renewables focused economy, should lead to a jobs windfall for Scotland, not for Spain, not for Belgium, not for the United Arab Emirates. And today's Scottish Government meeting with the companies and unions in the offshore sector is welcome. But does the First Minister recognise that what we need is not simply a one-off summit, but the establishment of a permanent council for the sector to develop a strategy for the industry and a forward-looking action plan? Will the First Minister establish such a body? First Minister. If that is one of the reasonable recommendations that come from the summit, of course we will uh, fully consider that and I would certainly uh, not be opposed to that kind of initiative. I want to make sure we are doing everything possible to capture the maximum economic benefit from the renewables low carbon revolution. It is in all of our interests to do that. This government has shown uh, our willingness to act. Uh, while there are big challenges for companies like Bifab, one of the reasons uh, why we're having the summit today, Bifab would no longer exist right now if it hadn't been for the intervention of this government. So we are determined to see that benefit in the supply chain of our economy. Of course, one of the things, and it's not the, the only factor here, um, but one of the factors is that we don't hold all of the levers, which is why we have invited the UK government to take part in the summit today. And I hope I would have Richard Leonard's support if we uh, have to ask for greater powers to deal with this. But I want to see us take action now. I want to see us maximise the, maximise the levers at our own disposal. And I want to see that uh, 50,000, around 50,000, as I said, which aligns with the, the figures from the trade union, I want to see that number of jobs increase uh, dramatically uh, over the years to come. And I think that's a massive opportunity we've got, and I'm determined that we seize it with both hands. Richard Leonard. <clears throat> uh, officer, the First Minister talks of action and ambition, uh, and uh, the First Minister has a bold climate change target, but her boldest climate change policy is a £150 million tax cut that benefits the richest people the most and actually drives up emissions. The First Minister tells us that she has factored this in, but that's simply not good enough. If the First Minister really is serious about the climate emergency, will she once and for all drop her commitment to cut the air departure tax? First Minister. Firstly, for for reasons that members across the chamber are aware of, uh, the reduction in air departure tax is not going ahead this year. Um, right across, and I said this a moment ago, the increase in our scale of ambition today will mean that we re need to reconsider policies across the whole range of our responsibilities. We have committed to uh, publishing a revised climate change plan within six months of the new legislation being passed, something the Environment Committee asked us to do. Uh, so we will need to, right across our range of responsibilities, look at way we're going to increase the scale of our ambition and that is a discussion that I hope all parties across this chamber will be involved in of course and this has been commented on uh, by global experts just today one of the things that sets Scotland's targets already even before today's announcement apart from other countries is that we include uh, things that other countries don't include one of those is emissions from aviation so if we are seeing an increase for whatever reason there we have to offset that from a decrease elsewhere uh, that that's one of the things, one of the many things that makes our targets genuinely world leading. Uh, so we do not shy away from our responsibilities here. Uh, but when it comes to things, and I say this to Richard Leonard seriously, uh, his opposition to things like the suggestion to give councils more power over workplace uh, parking, for example, if he wants to be taken seriously on climate change, then he has to rethink some of his positions as well. And if we're all prepared to do that, then not only will Scotland be a world leader in setting targets, over the next few years, Scotland will be a world leader in meeting those targets as well.
Now, we've got a, a lot of interest in supplementary constituency questions. The first from Alex Neil, to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the First Minister about the consequences of the liquidation of Healthcare Environmental Services Limited last Friday and the loss of 150 jobs and shots? Can I ask the First Minister if she will do all she possibly can to ensure that all the ex-employees of this company receive all the back pay and other monies they are still owed, amounting to an estimated total of a million pounds? Can I also ask the First Minister when the remaining 250 tonnes of medical waste still stored at the short site will be removed? And finally, can I also ask the First Minister to raise with the UK government the need to deal with the inadequacies in the Companies Legislation and the Companies Act, which have been highlighted by the demise of healthcare environmental. First Minister. Well, now that Healthcare Environmental Services has formally entered insolvency, the redundancy payment service will be in touch with the liquidators to put a process in place to enable ex-employees to claim for unpaid wages and holiday pay up to statutory uh, limits. In terms of the aspect of Alec Neil's question about uh, waste, uh, in terms of storage of waste, recent SEPA inspections have not identified any significant environmental risk mm. or any risk to the well-being of local communities. However, we will continue to work with SEPA to ensure that the sites are cleared safely and all waste disposed of appropriately should this become necessary. And in terms of the last uh, aspect of the question, in light of this case and all of the experience arising from it, we will consider whether any changes are required to company law, uh, which is, of course, reserved and if necessary we will communicate these suggested changes to the UK government. Janky Bailey to be followed by Sandra White. First Minister, pigeons were found roosting inside the Vale of Leven Hospital following the Easter weekend. Given that cryptococcus, an infection derived from pigeon droppings, contributed to the deaths of two patients at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, I'm sure the First Minister will appreciate the concerns of my local constituents. Can I therefore ask her to ensure that there is a review of infection control measures across all Scottish hospitals so that we deal effectively with the problem and improve patient safety? First Minister. Um, well, I thank Jackie Bailey for raising this issue. Uh, I understand that pigeons were found in a public area of the hospital that was not in use at the time. However, the facilities team uh, removed them immediately after the incident was reported and the room was then thoroughly cleaned with the recommended products for this type of incident. Uh, the steps that were taken by the board to manage this were appropriate and staff have been reminded to keep the windows closed to ensure this doesn't happen again. In terms of uh, any wider lessons learned than the ongoing reviews uh, around hospital infection arising uh, out of uh, the situation in Glasgow, we will make sure uh, that all appropriate lessons are fed into that and all appropriate lessons learned. Sandra White to be followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the mindless acts of vandalism on St Simon's Roman Catholic Church in Partick in my constituency this week. The Shrine of Our Lady of Chesticova, which has been part of the church since the 1940s and much loved by the Polish congregation, was desecrated. Can the First Minister offer guidance on what the Scottish Government can provide places of worship to deter these senseless acts of vandalism? First Minister. Well, can I thank Sandra White for raising this issue? Um, the vandalism of St Simon's Church is absolutely appalling and a complete outrage, and I'm sure everybody is of that view. And while it is for the police to investigate incidents such as this, including any motivation for it, uh, we should all be clear about this uh, anti-Catholic, or in this case, possibly anti-Polish uh, discrimination must not uh, be tolerated. Uh, just like anti-Semitism or Islamophobia, anti-Catholic discrimination is a scourge on our society and it must be eradicated. Places of worship, whether Christian churches, uh, mosques, synagogues, temples, any places of worship must be places of peace and sanctuary. And that's why the Justice Secretary and I have given a commitment to explore further what the Scottish Government could do to ensure safety and security for all faith communities and their places of worship. Monica Lennon to be followed by Angela Constance. Workers from Hare Myers Hospital in East Kilbride are protesting outside of Parliament right now against payroll changes by ISS UK that will result in a week's pay being withheld from them. Their hospital cleaners, porters, catering, maintenance and domestic staff who are low paid and are being forced to apply for payday loans. Richard Leonard and I addressed the rally on the way to the Chamber. Will the First Minister and the Health Secretary go outside and listen 
listen to the GMB Unison and the workers and commit to doing all they can to take the matter up with ISS UK and with NHS Lanarkshire. First Minister. Well, because this is um, a PFI uh, hospital, a, a PFI contract signed by a Labour government, this is unfortunately uh, first and foremost an issue between a private contractor and their staff. That said, NHS Lan Lanarkshire is actively trying to resolve the issue. Uh, our concern is for the staff involved who are valued members of the local healthcare team and it is vital to ensure that this doesn't impact on the hospital's ability to provide services to patients. Uh, the Health Secretary has written to the Chief Executive of ISS uh, today asking uh, them to seek an urgent resolution to this dispute in partnership with the Board and the Trade Union. I understand the Health Board has put forward solutions uh, and I would urge the company uh, to react positively uh, to that. Uh, she has also asked to meet with the Chief Executive uh, to encourage uh, him in person to follow the proposal from NHS uh, Lanarkshire. Uh, I understand the Health Secretary has also uh, offered to meet with the Trade Unions to discuss the action that the Government will take uh, in light of this. But this is uh, one example and one illustration of why the type of PFI contracts signed under previous Labour administrations were such a big mistake and I hope Labour have learned lots of lessons from them. Angela Constance. Thank you, President Officer. First Minister, it's now two years since my constituent Kirsty Maxwell died in Benidorm. And as you've met with Kirsty's family, eh, I know you're well aware of their ordeal. Now, notwithstanding the central role for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, I believe that there is more that we can do in this Parliament to support families like Kirsty's who have had a loved one killed abroad. Therefore, I wonder, will the First Minister commit to ensuring that before this year is out, that we can offer families, families like Kirsty's, something more than our condolences? like a service that provides practical, emotional and perhaps even financial support. First Minister. Um, yes, I agree very much with Angela Constance's uh, comments. Um, can I take the opportunity once again to pass on my sincere condolences to the family of Kirsty Maxwell? My thoughts uh, are with them at this very, very difficult time. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and I have met with Kirsty's family and indeed with other families who have been affected by the death of a loved one abroad. And from hearing uh, their experiences directly, I am of the view similar to that expressed by Angela Constance that the current system of support is not entirely satisfactory. Uh, I am very keen that we continue to explore the issue further, particularly in the context of the Victims Task Force and the forthcoming report from the All-Party UK Parliamentary Group on Deaths Abroad and Consular Services. Any improvements, of course, will require change across a number of services, and I would continue to welcome input from members and stakeholders as to how this might best be achieved. Um, I think all of us want to make sure uh, that we do hear these experiences and that we do everything within our power to ease as far as we possibly can the suffering of families in these circumstances. Question number three, Alison Johnson. Thank you. I congratulate the First Minister on her change of heart in declaring a climate emergency just weeks after voting against the Green motion to do just that. I welcome her change of heart and her commitment to introducing more ambitious climate targets. I'm also pleased to hear of Richard Lenner's passion for renewable jobs in light of his party's recent approval of a new coal mine. Now, an emergency demands immediate action. The world's climate scientists have warned that we have a decade to deliver the change we need to avoid climate catastrophe. So what immediate changes in government policy does the First Minister plan now that she has recognised the climate emergency? First Minister. Well, firstly, there's no change of heart. I mean, let me just quote uh, the chairman of the Climate Change Committee this morning. Scotland has been a leader uh, within the UK with many of its policies to tackle climate change. We said we would act on the updated advice, and that is exactly what we've done. The other parts of the UK, as far as I'm aware, haven't yet reacted or given commitments to the report published this morning. So in terms of uh, the commitment to recognise the climate emergency, the first thing we have done is increase the scale 
of our targets. We will now uh, look at our climate change plan. Uh, we will bring forward a revised climate change uh, plan within six months of the new Act passing. And we will look right across, as I said to Richard Leonard, right across our range of responsibilities to make sure that we are continuing the policies that we have underway just now, but also increasing where uh, that is necessary. And the advice of the Climate Change uh, Committee, the advice of uh, non-governmental organisations will be very important to us as we do that. Thank you. Alison Johnson. Targets, policies and plans are essential, they're important, but we need action. Investing in public transport and safer streets has a crucial role to play in tackling the climate emergency. Now, this government boasts of how it's doubled spending on walking and cycling, but it's still just 3% of the transport budget. Is it a surprise that we're currently seeing journeys by bike in Scotland at 1%? That's woeful. And in telling contrast, the Scottish Government continues to pursue a climate-busting tax cut worth £160 billion that would benefit wealthy frequent flyers the most. Young climate campaigners will not understand how the First Minister can support this. Now that you've recognised the climate emergency, will you abandon this unfair and environmentally damaging proposal and invest the money in active travel and in the public transport that people use every day? Thank you. First Minister. Well, firstly, it's because of the actions we have been taking across a whole uh, range of areas that we have already in Scotland almost halved our emissions. So the record in Scotland is a good one and it is recognised globally as such. But all of us, me included, recognise we have to do more, we have to do it faster, which is why we've made the commitment we've made today. We have doubled the active travel budget. You know, Alison Johnson can dismiss that, but it was widely welcomed at the time and it's an important statement of our intent. Working with the Greens, of course, we have uh, come forward with a plan to give councils more power, to raise more revenue, to invest more in public transport. Again, something uh, that is welcomed by those who care about uh, the environment. Uh, in terms of air departure task, it is not happening uh, this year for reasons that the Parliament is aware of. And that, and right across all areas of our responsibility, uh, the renewed commitment that we have made today will mean that we have to look carefully at every single policy. Because where I absolutely agree with Alison Johnson is setting targets is one thing, having the policy programme in place to meet them is what really matters. And that's what this government is committed uh, to doing and I look forward to uh, those plans being scrutinised by parties across the chamber and I look forward to all parties and this is probably not uh, fair to direct this uh, during a green question it's more directed at some of the other parties here but I hope all parties are prepared to rise to the challenge drop the knee-jerk opposition uh, when it suits the short-term politics and all of us unite behind doing what is right for the future of our planet Some further supplementaries. The first from Bill Kidd to be followed by Kezia Dugdale. Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what is the Scottish Government's position regarding the 9.4 million signatures gathered in support of the Bubakasha petition calling for an end to the nuclear weapons across the world? First Minister. Uh, well, we uh, take the view, which I think is a statement of the obvious, that the use of nuclear weapons would be indiscriminate and devastating, bringing unspeakable human suffering and widespread and lasting environmental damage. Uh, the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament have made clear our opposition to nuclear weapons. We need to do all uh, we can to create the conditions for a safer world without them. And so it's very encouraging uh, to see the number of signatories who have supported uh, the petition that Bill Kidd refers to. I take the opportunity uh, again today to call on the UK Government and indeed calling on all of those who have not yet taken steps to rid the world of these dreadful weapons of mass destruction uh, to reconsider and to reconsider urgently. Kezia Dugdale to be followed by Keith Brown. Thank you. This week, women in England and Wales were told that their entire email, message and photograph history would be subjected to police examination should they report a rape to the police. Whether it's what they wear, their sexual history or who they text, women are once again forced to choose between their privacy and the pursuit of justice. Can the First Minister explain what safeguards are in place to ensure this doesn't and couldn't happen in Scotland? First Minister. But, I thank Kezia Dugdale for raising uh, this issue. In all of the justice reforms uh, we are taking forward to tackle violence against uh, women, uh, rape, domestic violence, uh, we must make sure that the rights of women or 
those uh, attacked and abused are absolutely centre stage and we mustn't make it more difficult or more intimidating or more off-putting for women to come forward. Um, and I fear, as Kezia Dugdale does, uh, that uh, the announcements elsewhere in the UK may make uh, that uh, the case. So we will ensure uh, that that is at the heart of all of our justice policy and I'm sure this Parliament will work with us in ensuring that that is exactly the environment we are seeking to create. Keith Brown. Uh, to ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government has already or whether it intends to carry out a review of the potential impact on Scotland of leaks from the National Security Council and whether she agrees with me that as all service personnel, including members of my old unit, 4-5 Commando, who are in the gallery today, have to sign and abide by the terms of this Act as well as many others, that any breach of the Act by a member of the NEC should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. First Minister. Well, I think... Most people uh, would agree with the sentiments uh, that Keith Brown has just articulated there. Obviously, it is a matter for uh, the police to determine what criminal investigations they take forward and, and what the progress uh, of them might be. It would not be appropriate for me to comment on that. But what I would say politically, uh, as a politician, I think it is reprehensible uh, that there were leaks from the National Security Committee. Um, and, you know, I, I think it is a sign of the complete dysfunction at the heart of the UK government. Um, I think uh, any minister uh, who has been found guilty of leaking in such a way, I think it is right that they lose uh, their job. Um, but, you know, I think all uh, politicians, all politicians in government should recognise the responsibility and the privileges we carry uh, and should not be behaving in the way that it appears Gavin Williamson was behaving uh, for their own selfish political ends. Question number four, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Training Officer, to ask the First Minister what the social and economic impacts are of immigration. First Minister. Uh, all of Scotland's future population growth is projected to come from migration. It is essential for our future prosperity and delivery of our public services. Uh, we, all of us, in my view, have a duty to dispel the many myths about migration. We know that people who come to live and work in Scotland typically contribute more through tax revenues than they consume by way of public services. Research from Oxford Economics published last year found that people who arrived in the UK in 2016 are projected to make a total net positive contribution of just under £27 billion to the UK's public finances over the entirety of their stay. Uh, we should be very proud that people uh, have chosen to make Scotland their home and we should welcome the ways in which they shape our culture, our communities and our country. Stuart McWhelan. I thank the First Minister for that reply. In, in my group in Emberclyde constituency, there are hundreds of EU nationals who have chosen to make uh, my community their home, enriching the community. And does the First Minister agree with me that it's incumbent upon every Scottish politician to stand up for migrants and our communities, highlighting the huge contribution they make, not only culturally, but as, as the stats provided by the FSB this morning show to our economy, and also that the upcoming EU elections are an opportunity to show that Scotland is open and welcoming and by ensuring that anti-immigration parties such as UKIP, the Brexit Party and the Tories no longer represent Scotland in Europe. Can I just ask, can I just, can I just encourage members not to actively campaign for the European elections where they're imminent? First Minister. Uh, I agree with everything Stuart McMillan has just uh, said. In particular, the statistics that have been released by the Federation of Small Businesses today show that one in ten businesses in Scotland is led by a migrant entrepreneur. And these firms contribute more than £13 billion to the Scottish economy and provide more than 100,000 jobs. Um, and I think these statistics bring into sharp focus the catastrophic effect of the UK government's obsession with ending free movement uh, and the effect that could have on small businesses and our general economic well-being. So I think it's now vital and urgent for this parliament to have the additional powers we need to enable the design of migration policies that meet the needs of Scottish businesses, communities and public services uh, and to send a very clear message wherever we choose to send it that the Tories' hostile immigration environment is not welcome here in Scotland and it's time for it to end. Question number five, Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the long-term infrastructure recommendations of the Glasgow Connectivity Commission. First Minister. Uh, the publication of the Commission's report is very timely as Transport Scotland is currently undertaking a nationwide assessment of transport requirements. This is being done through an updated National Transport Strategy and the second Strategic Transport Projects Review. The strategic review will look at what infrastructure is needed to provide Scotland with a transport network fit for the future and it will advise ministers on future investments. We will consider the Commission's recommendations as part of this appraisal, allowing us to balance the needs of communities around the country. 
Bob, sorry, Jimmy Green. Thank you, President Officer. Um, can I commend the work of uh, Professor David Begg and his team for producing what I think is a sort of ambitious and forward-thinking plan that the Glasgow region is crying out for. It could transform how people travel and commute around Glasgow, but also offers a number of proposals which offer real economic upside to the entire west of Scotland. Uh, First Minister, I think this report deserves proper merit of scrutiny and debate given the scale of its proposals and the importance to Glasgow. Can she confirm how the government will address and respond to each of the recommendations made in the report and ensure that this report does not simply gather dust on the shelves of Glasgow City Council? First Minister. Um, I think I did do that in my original answer, but I'm very happy to actually agree with Jamie Green's assessment of uh, the Commission's report. I would also welcome and pay tribute to the work of Professor uh, David Begg and indeed pay tribute to the vision of the administration in Glasgow City Council for commissioning uh, this piece of work. I think it has great potential as a, a Glasgow MSP and a Glasgow resident. I can see the potential of many of its recommendations. It is now right that it is considered in full and that it is considered in the context of that broader strategic work that Transport Scotland is going to undertake. And the commitment I give today is that that will happen. That will allow the government to consider all of the Commission's recommendations and look at how they will benefit not just Glasgow in the west of Scotland, but how those kind of proposals fit in uh, to a strategy that benefits the whole of the country. And I'm sure uh, Parliament will be kept updated as that work proceeds. Question number six, Neil Findlay. Uh, to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government has taken to address climate change. First Minister. Well, as we have uh, already been debating today, there is a climate emergency and we must all act accordingly. That's why uh, the Scottish Government embraces today's report from the UK Committee on Climate Change and all that it contains. Uh, this morning we lodged amendments to the Climate Change Bill, which if supported by Parliament will set a net zero target for 2045, meaning Scotland's contribution to climate change will end within a generation. It would also make us carbon neutral by 2040. The committee's advice is clear that achieving these targets depends on action from the UK as well as the Scottish Government. As such, uh, we have today written to UK ministers requesting an urgent meeting and a collaborative approach. Uh, I can also confirm, as I think I already have done this morning, that we will also update the current climate change plan within six months of the bill re receiving royal assent as recommended by the Environment Committee. Neil Finlay. Yeah, I welcome the flurry of announcements from politicians, including the First Minister, declaring a climate emergency, but can the First Minister advise how appalling bus and train services and abstention by her, MSP, her MPs on Heathrow expansion, the failure to legislate for a legal ban on fracking, support for the expansion of air travel, and a policy to cut, then scrap, air departure tax, contribute to addressing the climate emergency, or could ever be described as world-leading? First Minister. Well, of course, it is global experts who describe uh, Scotland's actions as world leading and you know they're lining up today to do exactly that while encouraging of course uh, us to go further I, I think all parties should really get behind this now of course we will continue to have disagreements on individual policies uh, but the scale of ambition in these targets puts us way ahead of any other country in the world it redefines the bar of world leadership and it's something all of us should be proud of and I would say to Neil Finlay, as I said to uh, Richard Leonard, uh, if Labour, as I believe they sincerely do, want to see greater investment in bus travel, for example, why on earth are they so opposed to the proposal to give councils power to raise the revenue to do exactly that, to help get people out of cars and on to public transport? So there is a glaring inconsistency at the heart of Labour's position. And until they sort that out, they might lack the credibility to ask the kind of questions that Neil Finlay has just asked. Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the ambition on climate change, but this SNP government is set to miss its re recycling target by 12 years, has barely moved on transport emissions, and its lack of planning on a landfill ban could cost taxpayers £1 billion. Given these failures and a host of others, how can this Parliament have confidence that future targets will be met by this SNP government? First Minister. Because on climate change, we're meeting the current targets uh, and we're upping our scale of ambition so that we do even more in the future. 
Uh, you know, on a day where the Committee on Climate Change has issued advice, not just to the Scottish Government, but to the UK Government and the Welsh Government, and on the day where the Scottish Government has immediately accepted that advice, I haven't heard the UK Government accept the advice to it. Uh, I think the Welsh Government this morning have said they might respond by the end of next year to the Committee on climate change, uh, we are taking the world leading action that people expect us to take and we will make sure we have in place the policies to meet those targets. Uh, this is a responsibility for all of us and I say to the Tories, as I've said to Labour, we all have to step up to the plate on this and people will be watching closely in the months and years to come absolutely what this government does but they'll be paying very close attention to Tory policies as well and thus far I suspect the Tories will be found wanting so I hope that changes as well so that together we can make sure Scotland is a world leader not just in the targets we set uh, but in our meeting of those targets as well and that's something this and future generations will be proud of. And Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much, Scottish Liberal Democrats. Welcome the uh, decision by the Scottish Government uh, to the revised commitment to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2045. But last week, the First Minister told Willie Rennie she wouldn't drop her plans for a £250 million tax cut to the aviation industry, instead boasting that the government would just measure the extra emissions instead. This is a response she's repeated again uh, this week. This morning, the Chief Executive of the Climate Change Committee has said, quote, it would help immensely with the emissions challenge there is in Scotland if the government didn't choose to cut tax uh, to boost flights. So can I ask the First Minister again, will she accept this advice and scrap the proposed aviation tax cut? First Minister. Well, as I've said, I think uh, two or three times already today, uh, that change is not happening this year for reasons that have been well set out. But we will... We will consider our policies across the whole range of government responsibilities because that is what we require to do uh, in light of the advice that we are accepting uh, today. So we take that responsibility. But again, can I say to the Liberals, as I've said to Labour and I've said to Tories, when this Parliament returns uh, to discuss workplace uh, parking over the next few weeks, I'm going to remember uh, this discussion at First Minister's questions because you cannot have it both ways. You cannot call for the government to set world leading targets. You cannot call for the government to introduce policies and then for knee-jerk, easy reasons, uh, oppose everything the government comes forward with. So the responsibility is on all of us. Let's see if the other parties are willing to rise to it. And question number seven, David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government's made regarding the level of opiate addiction. First Minister. Achieving a comprehensive picture of addictive opiate use can uh, and is challenging, not least uh, due to the nature of illicit drug taking, and that means that there will always be a degree of estimation. Uh, I know that Dave Stewart has raised the issue uh, before of the impact of addiction uh, to prescribed opioids. Uh, these are very legitimate concerns due to the potentially highly addictive properties of these medicines. And these concerns were reflected in both our chronic pain strategy and refreshed uh, our polypharmacy guidance uh, published last year. Uh, through the national therapeutic indicators, we are monitoring the numbers being prescribed strong opioids over a long period. And this is informing the establishment of the chief medical officer uh, by the chief medical officer of a short life working group examining prescribing trends in Scotland. David Stewart. <clears throat> uh, will the First Minister join with me in congratulating the Sunday Times for their first class campaign highlighting the marked spiral prescriptions for opiates and the serious associated problems of addiction and overdose? Opiates contributed to 815 drug deaths in Scotland in 2017. Does the First Minister share my serious concerns that addiction created by super strength opiate painkillers, which have a dark side and can ruin lives every bit as much as illegal drugs? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do share that concern and I, I would congratulate the Sunday Times and others for raising uh, this important issue. Uh, opioid prescribing can be appropriate for short-term pain if that is part of an evidence-based clinical decision, but for longer-term pain, uh, clinicians are and should be advised to discuss alternatives with patients as part of uh, a quality primary care prescribing strategy. Uh, we published our first chronic pain strategy last year and one of its aims is to tackle the issue of over treatment. Uh, as I said, the Chief Medical Officer for Scotland is convening a short life working group of experts to examine prescribing trends in Scotland, which will complement work being undertaken by Public Health England on the evidence for dependence on and withdrawal from prescribed medicine. So these are important issues and it's important that we take them seriously. And I give an assurance today that the Scottish Government and our clinical advi advisors will continue to do so. 
Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on shortly to members' business in the name of Ian Gray on the 25th anniversary commemoration of the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Uh, there will just be a short suspension before the member debate, the debate begins to allow members and the Minister to change seats. A short suspension.